All right. Um, this is very encouraging. There are 49 of you here, and the range of ages is from 17 to 81. Um, Charlie, you get the oldest participant award. Uh, and, 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 and Wit, I think you're the youngest, 17. All right, so question number two, going back to that, uh, the, the, um, the assembly is redirected from just revising the 39 articles, wh about which they had made plenty of progress, but they came to see that this was inadequate. Uh, they needed a more expansive confession of faith to cover the issues that were pl had been plaguing um, England, Scotland, uh, the British Isles, that had been plaguing them for 100 years. And so they redirect their work, they are to produce these four documents, Confession of Faith, Church Government, Worship, and Catechism. Uh, so question number three, what documents did the assembly ultimately produce and in what order? 1644, Directory for Public Worship of God. 1645, Directory uh, for Church Government, Censure and Ordination. 1646, Confession of Faith. 1647, Shorter Catechism, 1648, Larger Catechism. All right, very good. There they are. So isn't it interesting? The first thing they did was the directory for worship. Why? You think we've had worship wars? I mean, this is in to a significant degree. This is a war about worship, about how, how is God to be worshiped? And uh, the, the imposition of the liturgy was the rub for so many of the, um, the pr Protestants, uh, so many of the Protestants in, in the British Isles. The imposition, um, they, they, um, they were zealous to gain the liberty to pray freely, not just pray according to the prayer book, to preach freely, not just read homilies, uh, to rid the services of surpluses and uh, so forth that were reminders of, of, of priesthood and to eliminate uh, kneeling and at the altar uh, before the... Um, before the, the host and other practices that they deemed to be uh, popish in nature. Uh, so the first thing that they produce is the directory for the public worship of God. And it is excellent. I've, I've written an article uh, after giving a lecture on the subject uh, a couple of years ago on the superiority of the directory of worship uh, to um, Calvin's liturgy in Geneva which I think it is signif a significant improvement on Calvin. I mean, the prayers in the directory are absolutely phenomenal. The prayer of praise, the prayer of confession of sin, the prayers of intercession, they are, they are models of prayer. And what they produce is a directory, okay? It's a directory, it's not an order of service. It's meant to be, it's meant to be a guideline for ministers. It's not giving them word for word direction as to what to say. And, and, and what to pray and, and how to pray what they pray. No, it's a, it's a guidebook, a guideline for this is, a, this is how worship should be ordered. This is, the, this is a kind of a prayer of praise with which to open the service. Calvin's liturgy didn't even have an opening prayer of praise. Okay, so this is, these are models. This is how you do a prayer of confession. This is how you do the five-fold intercessions. So it provides models for these things uh, uh, and we'll look at this in much more detail when we get to the chapter on religious worship. Yes? With the background of the English history that you've given so far, where does Calvin fall in? What, what years does Calvin minister? So Calvin goes back to Geneva after being exiled in 1541. Uh, so 1541, um, you, one year later, 1542, you've got, well, no, I'm wrong about that. Um, uh, what, what, 1549, so 1549, so nine years after, Cal eight years after Calvin returns to Geneva, you've got the, the 42 articles. England goes from being primarily Lutheran and outlook to being primarily Calvinistic uh, during those mid-1500s. Uh, um, and so Calvin in 1542 also publishes what becomes the normative Genevan um, a Genevan order of service that gets copied throughout the world. Um, Knox's form of prayers, the Puritans' Middleburg liturgy, 
uh, are two examples of the, the impact of Calvin, the influence of Calvin. Uh, 1562, the Geneva Psalter is published, all 150 Psalms, 1562. So uh, Calvin's at work and uh, people are just gobbling up what, he's, uh, what he is writing, but also there's a lot of others. Uh, you know, there's Peter, Peter Martyr, there's Martin Bucer, there's uh, Peter Vermigli, or, um, who's also called Peter Martyr. Um, uh, Heinrich Bullinger in, in, in Zurich has succeeded Zwingli. So, it's, you know, the Reformed tradition is not just Calvin. It's, there's a, there's a, you know, a collegial relationship between continental theologians, and they are churning out the, the, the books, and uh, they're being gobbled up by uh, the English uh, theologians and pastors. So, moving ahead to the assembly, uh, then they produced the Directory for Church Government. Of course, that would have been at the heart of the conflict. Uh, and uh, there's a conflict in two directions. There's the conflict with the Congregationalists, they're called independents at this time, who, who, um, who believe in the autonomy of the local congregation. Uh, so that's to the left, and then to the right are the Episcopalians who want a hierarchical church. And so there's a lot of debate and a lot of conflict over this, but they do produce uh, a church government that is Presbyterian, including church discipline and ordination. Well, there's a hand somewhere? Yes. Did Calvin hang on in, in Greater Europe? You hear a lot about him being read a lot in Britain and the islands. So in France itself, does Calvin catch on in Europe? In France itself, at one point, 40% uh, of the aristocracy, 10% of the population is converted to Protestantism. Um, uh, Holland becomes a Calvinistic nation. Um, there are a number of German uh, provinces that uh, become uh, reformed or Calvinistic in their doctrines. The Geneva, the Geneva Psalter, with its form of worship and, and psalms, is translated into multiple Southern European languages. And is, uh, so you have a Hungarian Reformed Church, a Romanian Reformed Church, and there's even a Poland Reformed Church that eventually gets squashed. Um, uh, Scotland becomes a Reformed nation. You know, they're Presbyterian. So, uh, uh, yes. His influence is phenomenal, and you could once once say one German one German historian said uh, John Calvin is the virtual founder of America because our country was founded primarily by Reformed Christians. So you take the New England Puritans, the Puritans, uh, the Scottish Presbyterians who were settling the middle, middle colonies at the time, according to Sidney Alstrom. Uh, Yale church historian who was one of the dominant figures in academia during the 60s and early 70s, uh, he said that at the time of the founding of the United States, 85% of the population was of the Reformed tradition. So it's, you know, his influence in, in America is phenomenal. You can't even understand what this country is without understanding its roots in Calvin's Geneva. Yes. And that would also be true of the, uh, the African church, the black American church, the first founder was primarily a Calvinistic movement. I don't think very many people know that. But, uh, so we'll get into that when we get, look at the de denominations in, in, in a minute in terms of the, the spread. Uh, all, all right, um, con uh, then the Confession of Faith is, is published in 1646. It goes up to Scotland and is adopted by the Church of Scotland. By the time it's adopted in England, it's too late. So very, very, right before, you know, just even a matter of months before uh, Charles II uh, reestablishes the Stuart monarchy and is king in England. It's only just a matter of months before that that it is finally adopted in, in, in England and then it becomes, you know, it, it, it loses all of its uh, authority with the reimposition of the episcopacy. All right, the Shorter Catechism is 1647. Larger Catechism in 1648. So I, I just point this out so that uh, you understand what we're going to be doing when we look at the Confession. We're going to supplement what we understand the Confession to mean by these other documents where they elaborate on some of these themes in more detail than they do in the Confession itself. Okay, question number four. What sources did the Assembly draw from in the formulation of the Confession, Catechism, and Directories? Well, here they are. So there have been those who have been audacious enough to think that um, that uh, the you know the, the the English Puritans were 
not uh, well informed and they didn't know what was going on on the continent and they weren't rooted in the creeds and this sort of thing and it's totally false. So the major influences on the confession are the ancient creeds, the Apostles, Nicene and Chalcedon. Uh, so the doctrine of God and the confession of faith uh, does not deviate from what Rome, Rome, uh, the Roman Catholics taught. Uh, there, there's a consensus, patristic, medieval, uh, reformational, and Roman Catholic, basically on the doctrine of God. Very few slight differences when it comes to that. So the ancient creeds are affirmed and are the language of it, you can find it in the confession. Then they're also influential was the Belgic confession. Belgic because it uh, was formulated in Belgium before it became, um, before they eradicated Protestantism and, and that part of the Low Countries. Heidelberg Catechism, which is still today the Catechism of the Dutch Reformed uh, throughout the world. Uh, so today the Christian Reformed Church, the United Reformed Church, uh, and so forth. Um, the Irish Confession was mainly written by Bishop Usher in uh, Ireland. Uh, 1615, the Council Canons of Dort, uh, 1617, which was an international gathering of Reformed uh, theologians, and then the 39 Articles uh, in the 1571, uh, the 1571 form. The other thing to re to realize again about about the scholarship behind the Confession, uh, the international academic language was Latin, and the the theologians. The, the, the Westminster divines, as they've come to be known, are in constant communication with the continent. I mean, even somebody like J.I. Packer, you know, mistakenly said that they, they really didn't know very much about what was going on in worship in the continent. And that, that idea just is just ahistorical. It's not true. There's constant communication. They're writing letters back and forth in Latin. They're reading each other's books. They're in Latin, so many of them. Um, and other things are, other works are being translated. Uh, I mean, the deep-rootedness of Latin uh, um, can, can be illustrated by the fact that at Princeton Seminary in this country, until Charles Hodge published his systematic theology in the, in the 1870s, so we're talking about that recently, that all the students read Turretin in Latin as their, their basic text for theology. It was just assumed, if you're educated, you can read Latin. So, and, and, and and American theologians, up until Edwards, so up until the 1730s, uh, they're all writing in Latin too, or much of what they write, they write in Latin. Mm -hmm. I don't think Edwards wrote anything in Latin. So, you know, for a th th 1,700 years, everybody is writing in Latin and can communicate with each other, and there's all this correspondence going back and forth with the continent. So. The background theologically is a very well-informed assembly of uh, theologians and pastors who make up the, the body of the assembly that's working on the confession. All right, number five. Before we move on? Yes. Um, you refer to these individuals as the Westminster Divine. They said have some meaning behind it. Are they divinely inspired uh, with these? No, it's just another word for pastors, theologians. Authors of the Westminster yeah. Confession. Okay. Yeah. yeah, good. Thank yeah, you. it's just old English. Okay. Yeah, you could call me divine if you want, but I. <laughs> <laughs> I occasionally talk to Emily after church, so I'm not going to call you the divine. One of the Savannah divines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> Irish confession up there, and what set would that have been performed? Uh, Absolutely. But, but in what sense it was a bishop, or the Presbyterian government he was part Well, I don't think it goes into church government. No, it's, it's just that it's a theological and pastoral. So an Archbishop Usher was invited to participate in the assembly, and it was deeply revered by the assembly of divines. <laughs> yeah, even, he was a bishop. So there were a, a, a handful of, of uh, Episcopal, Episcopalians by conviction in the assembly, five independents, Congregationalists, the rest of them are Presbyterians. Presbyterians dominated English Puritanism up to this point. And that's what they wanted in terms of government. Ben? Yeah, you mentioned on page nine the uh, publication of the Harmony of Confessions of the Christian Reformed Churches. Can you talk about that document? Was it, was it published with the, with the assembly and you influenced the work of the assembly? And 
I don't recall there being any connection. It's just that it happened providentially to be published and was a great asset to them in their work. So they were able very quickly and easily to draw upon the work of the other confessions. Again, it's all in Latin, so they're able to read it and digest it and translate it and use it. Yes? It being a republication, was it just a restatement of those confessions? Or it says it's a harmony, was there a previous harmony that was published? Or? So I take it, uh, I've not seen it, but I take it as a harmony that they would be lined up in columns. So, um, you know, doctrine of God. So you would have each of the confessions and you would be able to compare and turn the page, you know, doctrine of Christ. Then you'd have all the, so a harmony in that respect. So I have, a, I have, on, I have on my bookshelves a harmony of the Westminster standards mm -hmm. that has the confession and the catechisms lined up in that way. And that could be very, you know, that can be very useful. All right, so the, 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 the confession never takes root in its native soil in England. It does become the doctrinal standard for Scotland. Um, and then denominationally, uh, the Congregationalists, this is question number four, five. The Congregation, S 1658, issue their Savoy Declaration. So they altered the statement on the church government. Um, otherwise, and then there's, some, and we'll see as we go through, there are points here and there, but otherwise it's basically the Westminster Confession, tiny alter, alterations, main one being church government. So your American Puritans, they are Westminster men. And the Westminster Confession is dominating um, New England, you know, for its first 200 years. So from 1630 to 1830, you know, that civilization is being shaped by the Westminster Assembly and the catechisms. Uh, the Baptists. So you have uh, 1677 followed by the more complete London Confession of 1689. Matthew, you love that confession, but isn't it's virtually Westminster, isn't it? it yeah. Baptism? Yeah. yeah, I mean they're heretical on baptism, but otherwise it's <laughs> it's a it's a great con it's just Westminster. So church government and baptism, okay? They follow the Congregationalists on church government, local autonomy. And uh, they, they don't agree on baptism, and I think they tweak um, maybe this maybe the Lord's Supper. They, they, they take out good and necessary consequences. Do they? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm not remembering that, but I believe you. Yeah, we'll see that next week. Yeah, don't worry about it, Pat. We'll we'll get there next week. Yeah. Um, so again, so you're talking about what? Where are the theological roots? Uh, the Congregationalism, it's in the Westminster Confession. Baptist churches, to American Baptists are not Anabaptists. That's sometimes confusing for people, but the, uh, such as the Amish and the Mennonites and the Hutterites and uh, these other groups who are pacifists um, uh, and separatists, they form their own communities. That's a whole different tradition. American English-speaking Baptists, by and large, um, are the descendants of the Puritans. And so nearly all Baptists are Calvinistic uh, until you're into the middle 1800s. In fact, the founders of Southern Seminary to a man were Calvinists, and I think they were all uh, graduates of Princeton Seminary, the bastion of Presbyterian Calvinistic orthodoxy. Uh, so it's, it's only been, in, you know, since the mid-1800s that the Baptists then became more, do really dominantly uh, Arminian. And right now, there's kind of a revival of the Reformed faith going on among the Baptist churches. Well, did you just say that the Baptists were leading, leaning towards Arminianism? Uh, yes. Okay, they, I, they I, have I, the, I just thought I heard you say that. Yeah, for the last, you know, at least the last hundred and... 50 years, they've been that's been the trajectory increasingly, but I think that's halted and reversing because, once again, Southern Seminary, as well as several others, are, are more and more dominated by Calvinists. <coughs> so it's, a, it, it's an interesting development. Okay, number six, what characteristics of the Westminster Standards 
commended by various spokesmen, stand out to you? The men of whom the world was not worthy. Yes, but in what ways? Um, they were men of whom the world was not worthy, in part because they produced this document. But So my question is, what is it about the document that um, stands out? What, what, what are the strengths of the confession? Verified. Okay. Concise. You could write a book on every article. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, every chapter and every sub-article, you could write a book on it. And yet they managed to boil it all down to very concise, succinct statements. What is, you know, the catechism, I think, is, a, is the, maybe the best illustration of that. You know, what is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and changeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. What is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. So just recently, there's a 400-page book published on justification. You can write a whole book on every article in the Confession of Faith. They get it all down to succinct, precise um, statements. So I would add, in addition to succinct, comprehensive, and precise. The whole waterfront is covered in the 30, how many chapters? 30, 34, 33 chapters. The whole uh, body of systematic theology. Uh, so in that era, they didn't write systematic theologies, but they wrote what they called the body of divinity. So uh, I think the best known, most popular one of those that's still in print is Thomas Watson's, it's called A Body of Divinity. Um, and it, it, it purports to be a, a systematic theology. And all it is is an exposition of the confession, um, including the confession's handling of the, the Lord's Prayer and the sacraments. Uh, so it's, uh, you, wanna know, you wanna know the sum of Christian doctrine. You wanna know what the Bible teaches on the whole range of subjects, you study the confession, and, and you'll get there without having to read uh, you know, a half a dozen 500 page books. Question? Uh, or com more comment on what stands out. This is a final statement or culmination of 1,600 years of conflict, fusion, deception, and, and ending up in, in something that, that um, for the last 400 years we've had as a, a tool for what we stand on, what we believe. How do we explain it? It's a statement of faith. It's just a, a very intricate, drawn out, ex 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 expository um, expression of what we believe. And how do we stand on that? Yes, so let me, let me put uh, these items down that you've been naming. Uh, concise, comprehensive, precise, um, learned. What, uh, what Jim has just been saying, 1,600 years of learning are packed into it. So uh, which, by which I mean they knew the church fathers, they knew the medieval theologians, they know Aquinas, um, uh, and, and, they know Lombard, they, they know all the medieval theologians. Uh, they, Bernard of Clairvaux was among the most beloved of, you know, of all the medieval authors. So they, 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 know, they, they know their Roman Catholic contemporaries, and then they know all the Protestant theologians as well, the Lutherans, the Anabaptists, and, and, and reform, their Reformed predecessors. So th this is a very, they're, they're, this is a very learned doctrine, uh, document, fully, fully informed. Um, in the, the history of Christian doctrine, the history of the church, the history um, of the conflicts within the church and doctrinal distinctions and so forth. Uh, these are very academic. These are among, among the most learned men of their day are, right, are, are putting together the confession. Uh, so, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, not just, you know, the, these are not things that they just, just you know, dreamed up together. Uh, uh, at the moment, yes. I just one of the things that really stands out to me is the humility of the authors. That they're just very much exalting the scripture over themselves, and that's like just not any self-aggrandizing. They're so smart when it comes back to the word of God. Well, it's interesting that we don't know the names. Um, Unless we really look into it, we really don't know the names of any of the men involved. You have to really want to get into it to figure out who, who, who are these people. And there is a list of names at the beginning. 
But if you ask, you know, the average Presbyterian, the student of it, you, you don't have any idea who they were. So I say, Williamson is writing in a vacuum. He, he doesn't refer to anything that any of them wrote. He doesn't refer to any of them. You know, it's to say, well, what he meant, what this line means is this, because, you know, Tuckney wrote such and such. No, he doesn't know. Or he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't refer to it. Yes, David. In the original document, are those scriptural references there? Yes. But in the books we read, the scriptural references are right there listed under that. Yes. So what happened was they produced the confession and they sent it to the parliament for approval. Parliament sent it back and asked for scripture proofs, which was resisted at first because they didn't want simplistic, uh, we have a question about the scripture proofs here in a minute. They didn't want any kind of simplistic proof texting. Um, and in fact, the right way to understand the scripture proofs is to understand them to be a reference to a history of ex exposition. That again goes back to the church fathers, the medieval theologians, their contemporaries, both Roman Catholic and Protestant. So they kind of signposts to a whole body of literature and a history of interpretation that lies behind them. So there's an excellent, an excellent article that was written by Richard Muller about the scripture proofs, in which he takes on the argument that these are simplistic, blunt. Um, not well-informed uh, scripture proofs. He takes a couple of what he, what people generally believe as the, as the worst of the scripture proofs. Like, what does this have to do with proving that? And then he goes back in and he looks at um, the English annotations as one example, which is a contemporary uh, publication that was, uh, in effect, the an English study Bible, one of the first English study Bibles that has explanatory notes. And he goes then to the notes, and the notes refer to, referring to that sub supposedly blunt, crude, ill-informed proof text, in fact, has a whole history of interpretation behind it that can be seen in the English study Bible, the English annotations. So they have been discredited for generations, and Mueller has resurrected their reputation. And just says, look, people who are critical of the proof text, they just don't understand the way those texts have been handed, handled historically and how they've been understood. Um, logical, you know, there is a logical progression from um, God to man to the fall to Christ to the, um, the, uh, the um, uh, securing of uh, redemption to the application of redemption to the Christian life. It's very logical flow. Um, yes, question? Before we go too far from that, the proof texts and the historical interpretation of those proof texts, is there a document that has the historical interpretation of those proof texts? No. You, know, you got to dig. <laughs> uh, logical pastoral. This is perhaps the most surprising thing, and and far as I'm able to establish, the most neglected part of the of the confession. The ca confession is extremely pastoral. Uh, 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 section after section after section, it highlights the pastoral implications of this. What does this mean for us? Uh, you know, if take, take the doctrine of predestination. You think, well, that's pretty impractical. No, they draw right out various ways in which we are to understand that. Now, it's succinctly put. It's a summary. But nevertheless, uh, they talk about uh, the comfort to be derived from knowing your salvation is in the hands of God. And that's secure. So that, that's just one example. And chapter after chapter after chapter, you just, you just see them thinking, all right, what does this mean for the average person. What does this mean for the believer? How, how does this impact his own outlook and practice? So pastoral, practical, uh, re really the same, the same point. Uh, they're, 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 there's so much that is of a practical nature. And so, the, for example, the exposition of the Lord's Prayer. I mean, that's pretty practical um, that you have uh, with the catechisms, uh, both the larger and shorter catechisms. Um, uh, have extensive sections on the Ten Commandments and on the Lord's Prayer um, that are just a, a <laughs> applying uh, to life uh, the meaning of those two, you know, crucial uh, documents for, you know, the Lord's Prayer above all teaches us how to pray the Ten Commandments, but above all else tells us, you know, teaches us the moral code that God requires of his people. So very practical, uh, the confession, the catechisms together. Uh, any any uh, 
Any other questions about all that? It's kind of concise, but a great economy of uh, yeah. And also the ability to address situations at the time in response to what's going on, but applicable through time, is is very interesting because of the the cycles of things that happen in structured religion throughout the years. Yes. So it has been pointed out, realizing that there is a war raging around them, a civil war going on, um, there's a calm and peace about the, you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know that they were under stress and duress of civil war uh, in their nation. It's uh, almost as though they were able to remove themselves from that context entirely and just uh, work at the things at hand. All right. Um, Question number seven. How do the Westminster Standards shape the life of the local congregation? Good. The uh, statement is, how, how uh, you might rather ask, how do they not shape the life of the local congregation? Um, how do we choose our ministers? You know, our ministers subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith. So that's going to determine who, who can be a minister here and who cannot be a minister here. Uh, so if we just stopped right there, that's critical. Uh, that, that reduces the pool of potential ministers from vast proportions to tiny proportions. He's got to be a Presbyterian. He's got to subscribe to the Westminster Standards. Otherwise, he can't be the pastor of the church. So how many ministers are there in America? A gazillion, right? And instead, you 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 got to you got to pick out of a pool of literally in the hundreds. Uh, okay, so officers who can serve as an officer of this church since 1755, who can serve as an officer of this church? He's got to subscribe. It's always been required. So if you want to be an, a deacon, you want to be an elder, you have to subscribe to the confession. So that eliminates a lot of people. You can't be an officer if you don't believe the doctrines of the confession. So it's going to determine who the officers are going to be in the church. They have to be pe people who understand, uh, who believe, who subscribe to, who, who believe that the confession summarizes the doctrines taught in scripture. Um, okay, the doctrines that we believe, they are, of course, they are the doctrines of the, the government of the church, uh, the form of government, the fact that uh, uh, we have a body of elders. The fact that we have a representative form of government uh, in which the people elect elders is determined by the confession. The people elect people who represent it. We don't have a democracy. We don't have a monarchy. The Episcopalians, that's a monarchy. The Roman Catholics, that's a monarchy. Uh, uh, many of the Bible churches, independent churches, like the one I grew up in, the Baptist church I grew up in, Every single decision was made at the monthly business meeting. Okay, that's a, that's a pure democracy. Uh, ours is a democratic republic. The form of government is the people elect elders who make decisions. Uh, you don't like the decisions, what, what uh, recourse do you have? You throw the bums out and you elect new ones. It's just like in, you know, did, did we get to vote on Obamacare? No, we didn't, the con uh, Congress did that. Uh, you don't like what they did? You, you elect other people, but they, they represent you. They then have power. They make decisions. They, they implement programs. So we have the kind of government, kind of worship that we, uh, we have. We don't have a prayer book. Um, uh, we give emphasis to the reading. Well, we put the Bible at the center of everything we do. Uh, the word is read. It's preached. It's sung. It's prayed. We understand the sacraments to be visible words, so the word is being displayed in the sacraments. Our whole theology of worship is determined by the confession. So something that's also struck out to me that, that struck me when I first visited here is how explicitly Trinitarian the services are. Yeah. Every church I've been in believed in the Trinity, but how explicit you make that throughout the service, from the call to worship to the benediction. So, as an example, we pray to the Father through the Son uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
before we preach or read scripture, we pray for the illumination of the spirit. When we confess our sins, we pre uh, plead the atonement. Um, so yes, the worship is thoroughly Trinitarian. Uh, so yes, and, 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 and so, um, you know, I, I wrote a chapter on the Trinity and um, identity and attributes of God, and, and I introduced that chapter by citing people who say this is the most um, impractical and unutilized doctrine in all of uh, the Christian church, uh, to, to then, I, I, then, I then set out to refute that every, every single time we get together, we are worshiping according to the doctrine of the Trinity, to the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Spirit. And it's reflected, like you say, all through, implicitly and explicitly. Uh, so, and, you know, so our worship and our, the practices of the church, yes? Hand. Yes, David. I was going to say, a lot of what we see here has to do with uh, the leadership and structure of the leadership, but there's an ascent of the people who are there to worship, the gathering, the, the congregants, that is also affected by the Westminster Confession. Our understanding of some of those uh, uh, doctrines and precepts allow us to uh, to submit to leadership. That's, you know, that's so, so I think, uh, David, can I translate what you're saying? Please that maybe I should put another item down here, which is members. In some ways, you know, the membership of the church is determined by the Westminster Confession because that's what they're going to hear. You know, you, I don't know, in 35 years here, you know, probably a dozen times I've actually referred to the confession, but behind everything that's being preached, our understanding of the whole range of biblical doctrines behind it is the understanding that's expressed in the confession. Uh, so that's then what the congregation hears and, and, and adheres to, or they go somewhere else. Is that basically what you're... Yes, because when that was what struck me, I guess, when I first came here. I didn't know that this was what it was until I took a leadership course. But the harmony and the unity that is brought together in the body is an outgrowth of us ascent to those principles. Yes, so David is saying that the unity and harmony in the church is built on a consensus that the confession indeed does represent the teachings of scripture to which we all adhere. So in that hand, the reason why we have the kind of inquirers class that we have is because of that conviction. So we have an inquirer's class that is very heavily doctrinal, which makes it unusual. Most churches are not that way. Because it was my conviction that we needed to aim at conviction as people come into the church. We want them to know what we believe and be convinced that these are the things that should be believed and practiced. So that when they join the church, they know exactly what they're getting into. And it's agreeable to them. They either believe it themselves or they understand what they're going to hear and, and are not so concerned as to leave and go somewhere else. So that, that, that brings a unity and a consensus to the church that I think otherwise if people just, you know, there are churches where you join the church and, and uh, you know, Sunday morning you just decide and, you know, they have you walk forward and you, know, you say, well, I want to join. And they, they you know, they, they, they administer the vows right there. You just join without any information at all. Uh, that would be one extreme. We think that you need to know what you're getting into so that you are not surprised and disappointed or angered when you hear something you hadn't anticipated when you started attending. All right, number eight. What is wrong with the motto, no creed but the Bible? Uh, the, the simplest way to explain that is that saying no creed but the Bible is a creed. That in itself is a creed. You just said something of what you believe. And so that becomes a creed. It's inevitable, like it's written here. You, it, you have to have a creed. You have to have something to say that declares what you believe. I think i got to write that one down. No creed but the Bible is a creed. It's, it's an affirmation of, uh, of belief uh, that is unproven. In fact, it's just a, an assertion that we should have no creed but the Bible, but it's a conviction that one has. That that because in, 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 in the course of affirming it, you are establishing a creed that is affirming the very thing that you're denying. Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. That prohibits all things but recitation of the scripture itself. It does. It does. The, uh, the statement is it would disallow anything being said from the pulpit or the lectern except the, the words of Scripture themselves. As soon as you begin to elaborate, you're formulating doctrines. Uh, and, and yet that's what God calls his servants to do, is to elaborate and to uh, amplify and to explain and illustrate and apply and exhort on the basis of that. Yes? I, I think the most compelling short response to that is the two questions that we mentioned in the notes. One, does the Bible speak with one voice? And if it does, and if it doesn't, you've got bigger problems. If it does, can anyone but me understand it better? I think I'm kind of smart, but I'm not that smart. No. No, there's an arrogance. Um, there's an arrogance. I'm, I'm reading a very um, high, um, what is it, what do I want to say, published, vastly published, hugely published, massively published Presbyterian theologian right now. And I am astonished at the arrogance in page after page after page. Um, he makes no references uh, virtually no references to 400 years of reformed commentary on the subjects. He doesn't bother with the church fathers. He doesn't interact with any medieval theologians. And then he'll say, scripture does not support this view. Um, and, and I'm just thinking, do, do you not think that like your predecessors over the last 2,000 years knew about the Bible verses that you think are refuting the positions that they held? I remember hearing about... Um, uh, a student who was formerly at Dallas Seminary told me a story about um, about uh, a class in which uh, the professor was arguing against limited atonement, um, and, and he cited a verse in, in First First John that uh, uh, that Christ is the Savior of the whole world, not for, not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world. And he says so that refused, and they just went on. And he said he sat there thinking, "Do you think that?" People that believe in limited don't, don't know about that verse. You have to do more than just cite the verse, don't you? You have to explain how you understand the verse and how that relates to the, you know, our understanding of the atonement and the application of the atonement and the, the extent of the atonement and the nature of the atonement. You have, you have to explain these things. But he didn't. He just cited the verse as though nobody ever seen the verse before. Yes. Well, to your comment there is as soon as someone brings me one piece of scripture and says that's why I believe then my question is show me another piece of scripture that supports that because that's the beauty of the Bible is it supports itself mm -hmm. if there's something that you've interpreted from the Bible through one piece of scripture then by golly you ought to be able to support that through numerous pieces of scripture not just one so when yes and when we get to chapter one of the confession we will see that that is exactly what the confession teaches uh, about the perspicuity of scripture. Scripture is clear in that if it's unclear in one place, what is obscure there is more clearly taught somewhere else. Yes? It seems to be just the fifth commandment to honor that mother and father. We can, <laughs> we can establish that as just my biological father, my biological mother, but so far beyond what Christ did with every other commandment, so it's so much bigger than just the, the uh, the specific narrow application that we thought it was, it was all of those who came before us. That right, and, and, and chapter 5 of Matthew, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is establishing exactly that. You think that the seventh commandment only forbids adultery? You are, you are confining the, the expanded interpretation of that, which is to the hard attitude. Of, if you've lusted, you've violated the command. Murder, you have murder anybody, but do you hate? you have uh, murderous anger, um, then you're in violation. So, yes. All right, a uh, couple of more here. Uh, what do we mean when we say the Westminster Standards are subordinate standards? <coughs> subordinate standards. Yes, very important point. They are our standards, but uh, we must never lose sight of the fact that they are subordinate standards. And what are they subordinate to? They're subordinate to the scriptures. So the Bible's up here. Now the confession's down here. So ultimately, what we believe is rooted in Scripture, of which the confession is a very handy and faithful interpretation of what's in the Bible. 
um, that reflects the consensus of Christendom for its first uh, 1,500 years and the consensus of, of Reformed Protestantism over the next 400 years. Um, this is what the best of us have believed. Uh, so I may want to kind of launch out on some other, um, you know, belief system or, or article of faith here and there, but I need to know that, that when I'm doing that, I am doing so um, in conflict with this great host of witnesses who who, who believed contrary to the, the conclusions that that I'm that I'm drawing. There's no statement of that in the West Coast. Yeah, there it is somewhere. Yeah, we'll get to it. All right, number 10, lastly, uh, what should be our outlook on scripture proofs? I guess I've already answered that. You said it before, serves as a, serves as a signpost to an exe, and I may have added it, to an exegetical tradition. Uh, yeah, that's what you said. Yeah, it, they are. Yeah, they, they, they didn't just pull these things out of the air. Just saying, well, that sort of touches on this. They, so like I say, uh, Richard Mueller uh, wrote that beautiful art article that establishes that, the, um, that every one of them represents an exegetical tradition that goes, most of which would go back to the church fathers and certainly goes to the Reformation. Where this passage was understood to teach these things. And, and here's, and so behind the scripture proofs is a whole history of interpretation um, they, um, they are not um, naive uh, proof texts by any mean, by any means. All right, so that's all of it. Um, any que questions b before we? <coughs> that's uh, the last point you just made, Pastor. Uh, that could be kind of important because I hear you preaching from the pulpit that uh, everyone's trying to have the option to make themselves what they want to be. But you, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, everyone, you were preaching from the polls lots of times. Somebody help me out here. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks they have the right to you know, choose what they want to be, what gender, and so forth and so on. But tradition and creation tells us. You can't. It's not well, right. in, in terms of what was just said, uh, I, I, I think that not, not uh, what our society is saying is that this ideology that separates uh, sexual identity from the body um, is unprecedented and is in defiance of the entire history of the human race. Uh, whether we're talking about Europe, Africa, Asia, um, you know, South America, North America, Pacific Islands, in utter defiance of the entire witness of all of humanity since the time since time was recorded. This is pretty new. Okay, class. Uh, what's needed yeah. for, for next week? St study number two. two. With your answers completed. All right. Great. Persevere. Keep at it. <laughs>